Hello, everybody. This is Barbara Drazga from uh, Deal Diva Wholesale and the Bumble Masterclass. And tonight we are um, honored to have with us George Lawrence from Merchant Words, who's just, he's got the most bubbly personality. I've met him at a couple of events in the past few months, and he's just always, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure if we just colored his beard white a little bit more and put on the red hat and the suit, he would make a great Santa. He's got such, look at him. I mean, seriously, look at this cheery, bubbly personality. So I adore George. Him, he and his family are just really amazing people, um, top notch. Uh, he, he has developed this tool called Merchant Words that I know you guys have heard me talk about a million times in the class and my, on my uh, Facebook group. So tonight uh, he's going to talk about you know, the future of Merchant Words, the future of keyword research, how we can leverage keywords to make more money and to sell more stuff in Q4 and forward. And um, just tell us a little bit about himself and how he got to where he is in the Amazon community. So George, I'm going to quiet down right now, and I'm going to let you dig in and tell us who you are and what you're doing. Well, jump in anytime. And Barbara, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's a thrill for me to be chatting with you and your audience. Hi, everyone. Uh, but you know, you uncovered my secret identity. This is why I'm so busy in Q4 every year is because you know I'm, I have to supervise the elves at the North Pole making the toys. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, no. So let, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I've been a long time Amazon seller. I also did eBay for a while. And back in the early, early days, this is like five or six years ago, uh, I was just trying, I, was, I had a day job making ends meet just barely and doing the e-commerce stuff on the side to try to add an extra, a little extra to the bottom line of our family's budget. And then my daughter went to college. You know, she asked if it was okay if she went to this expensive college that she found. She fell in love with it. I'm like, we'll figure out how to pay for it somehow. Just go. And then after about a year of that, the college savings was gone and we were struggling to like make all of our bills on time. And so I figured, you know what, there's no way I'm going to let my daughter down. So I started cutting corners by being late on my mortgage just to be able to afford her tuition payments. And after a while, I get some nasty grams from the uh, mortgage company. So oh, I go back to paying those bills, but now I can't afford tuition. And so it goes for a while until I get nasty grams from both companies. And I'm like, you know what? If I don't change my life somehow, then I'm gonna be wound up. I'm gonna wind up out on the street, no house, and my daughter's gonna kick out of college. That's no way to live. So the the origin story of Merchant Words was I realized I needed to do something to grow my e-commerce business, and I used my experience as a computer programmer to put together some uh, little scripts and things that would populate a database. And it turns out that was pretty useful for both growing my own business, and I told some other friends about it who were e-commerce sellers, and they thought it was fantastic. And I said, you know what? Why don't we see if we can help more people with this? And that was actually the birth of Merchant Words. And ever since that moment until today, I'm just really happy. Now, it's, it's fun to run your own business, no doubt. But, uh, and of course, when I quit my day job to focus on this full time was a really exciting day. But uh, the thing that really inspires me most is the fact that just this small, simple tool that I wrote is able to help so many sellers. So that's, that's kind of my background. That's where I came from. Uh, but let me tell you about uh, wh what we've done recently and where we're going in the future. Uh, feel free to jump in anytime with questions, and I'd love to get to your questions later on. But uh, if you've ever used Merchant Words, essentially, you know, it's where a database of keywords, and those keywords come directly from Amazon. We visit Amazon just like you would visit Amazon, and as you're typing in uh, the search queries that you type into Amazon, all kinds of suggestions pop up. We collect all those. We put it in our database, and then what we do is we apply a little bit of deep learning, AI, fuzzy logic, you know, data science, all that kind of stuff. But what essentially what we do is we try to reverse engineer what we believe is a reasonably uh, fair estimate of how many searches these search terms get every month in Amazon. So to be clear, the phrase itself, we get directly from Amazon, but then we have to estimate the search volume. But that search volume has good science behind it because what we do is we pay attention to how the searches appear from Amazon and use that to figure out what the search volume is gonna be. So for the longest time, that's essentially what our product was. It was just simply a database of search terms and you could query through it however you wanted to. Now it's simple, but it's powerful because most of our customers, as you can imagine, are Amazon sellers, many of whom already have a product in mind. They've already decided what to source from a manufacturer in China, or they already look for arbitrage opportunities or however their personal uh, e-commerce e business works. But then when they have the listing in mind, what they'll do is they'll go out and then they'll discover the keywords that other people are using to search for that existing product. And that's fantastic because if you have a listing, it's maybe not doing so well, your very next step should be optimize the listing, right? So that's absolutely the right way to use our keyword tool. Another set of customers are still Amazon sellers, but they use our product, or they use Merchant Words for 
product ideation. They use it to figure out, you know, I can sell anything online, but before I decide what to sell, let me figure out if people are searching for it. But more importantly, how people are searching for it. And that's really interesting because often when we bring a new product to market and we take all the effort and energy to design it and have a, a, someone source it for us, a manufacturer, often in China or somewhere, uh, when we have a manufacturer create a brand new product that never existed before, there's a lot of effort and energy. But often what it is is a slight variation of an existing product. And those variations, we can discover those by looking not just what people are searching for, but how they're searching for it. So it could very well be that the opportunity isn't so much to bring a brand new product to market that had never existed before. It could be that the opportunity is to bring a new variation of an existing product. And if you discover that people are searching for that product with that kind of variation in mind, let me give you a stupid example. Let's say that there's tons of dog bowls made out of plastic, right? Tons of those, right? So don't necessarily bring a dog bowl made out of plastic, but a gold-plated dog bowl. Well, then if you discover there's people searching for that, then maybe that's an opportunity in an unserved market. So anyway, like I was saying, a lot of our customers are Amazon merchants who already have their product in mind, already have their listing. They just need to optimize it. That's fantastic. Others of our customers are uh, looking for new product ideas, and so they use our database to figure out how people are searching uh, and, and the variations that people use when they search. That's fantastic. But we also have another segment of customers of Merchant Words that actually aren't online sellers at all. And what they do is they're more marketing. And so they're interested in now looking for a keyword tool that'll help them understand what's in the mind of a shopper because their use for it is perhaps to build landing pages or to help guide their content strategy as they're building, uh, I don't know, blog posts or whatever. And so it's interesting to me that across the whole spectrum of how you can use the intelligence of understanding what people are searching for, you can use it in a variety of different ways. Uh, okay, so I got off on a little tangent about uh, what kind of customers and, uh, we have and what they use our product for, and that's what they essentially use our existing product for. We just recently launched a few enhancements. Um, most notably now, we are much more frequent with our data updates. Now, most notably, I probably shouldn't have said that. I notice it a lot because I'm constantly looking at the back end and how frequently our keywords are researching. Uh, but that's not really, it doesn't really look like a new feature to our end users who are on the website. Uh, the biggest new thing for our features on our website is we completely redesigned the UI a few months ago. So if you were an existing... Now, now uh, I'm going to pause you for just a second, please, George. Please, please, jump uh, in. We're not all computer program whizzes like you are. So UI means user interface. <laughs> so Thank a you. user interface is what you see when you log in or when you go to merchantwords.com um, and you, you, you see what you see on the screen, you're the user, that's the interface. So. Yep. <laughs> Thanks very much for slapping me down there. Yeah. Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry. I didn't mean to no, do that. No, no, it's, it's to not. Sure that there was nobody in the chat saying, what is a UI? Is that like some sort of infection? I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. No, no, no. We, well, we've completely changed the whole IV of our, yeah, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but, um, uh, so the user interface used to be very simple and it's, it's still simple, but uh, it used, used to be mostly black and gray and things. And we're like, you know what? I'm I, just me personally. I got tired of looking at the same kind of brownish blackish website the whole time. And so we hired some designers to give us a fresh new bright look. And uh, you know, I'm really happy with the outcome. If, if you've used Merchant Words in the last couple of months, or if you just go to it now, you'll see kind of a fresher, uh, happier, brighter UI uh, user interface. And we're really happy about that. And so that was our kind of our big customer face thing but as far as the data goes in addition to refreshing more frequently which was an important enhancement that we made we've also added multiple Amazon marketplaces so for the longest time we were just US only and then we realized of course that many US sellers are looking to branch out to Europe or vice versa many Amazon sellers are in Europe in fact in China a lot of the Chinese manufacturers who sell across the different Amazon marketplaces they're of course interested in US because that's the biggest and the Right on the heels of the U.S., they're really interested in UK, Germany, and the rest of the European market. So, we did exactly what we used to. Do. We did exactly what we do for U.S. Amazon data, and we started rolling that out to the other marketplaces. We have Canada, uh, UK, Germany, Italy, France, and Spain. Will you be adding Australia as Australia opens up more? So I have this bad habit of promising exactly when our new features are going to be released. So as long as I can put a little disclaimer up in the air, here's, here's my little asterisk. As long as I can put a little disclaimer up in the air that I don't yet have a schedule of when we're going to roll these features out to be publicly available. But on our roadmap is a variety of Amazon marketplaces. We are doing Japan, we're doing India, and we are absolutely doing, um, uh, we are absolutely doing Australia. The only thing is, Australia right now, as you know, is really just digital download products. They haven't 
launched the whole prime infrastructure. They haven't launched everything there is to launch yet in Australia. When they do, then we'll be able to collect the full breadth of keyword data from Australia. Because there's really no data other than the digital products. There's not a, a breadth of data for Australia yet. That's right. And actually, I was, I, I was just down in Australia a few months ago uh, at Phil Lay's Retail Global Conference. Had a great time down there. And, and plus, Australia's beautiful. Even if you're not going down for a conference, you just go down to see it. But, but when I was down there, I'm thinking, you know what? We should just start collecting Australian data right now. Let's see what happens. So I called my programmers back home and I said, hey, just as an experiment, let's take the same uh, keyword collection algorithm that we have and that we're using in Europe and the United States. And let's just point that at Australia and see what happens. He's like, okay, boss, no problem. We'll take care of that. And he called me about 10 minutes later. He's like, it's done. I'm like, what do you mean? It usually takes, you know, days and weeks. He's like, no, no, it's done because there's only a few hundred keywords to collect. <laughs> there's nothing there yet. And, and so the, the moment that Australia launches, then you'll see this rich depth of all of the things people are searching for, all the things people are buying. And when that happens, then absolutely, we'll follow on the heels of that as soon as we're able to, to have a, a deep Australia keyword data set. And it makes sense that as a new market grow, a new Amazon market grows, uh, the more users they have and the more searches they have, the more robust the data um, with which to work becomes. Exactly right, because uh, when you see the suggestions, and of course when you're doing a search in Merchant Words, which will show you those suggestions, you're not seeing the inventory of what Amazon has, you're seeing the breadth of what people are searching for. So if someone searches for something, even if there's no seller in Amazon that sells it, it'll still show up in the suggestion drop down. So as, as you mentioned, it's absolutely right, it'll be a while, who knows if it's days or weeks or months, but it'll be a while for Amazon to begin collecting the full breadth of everything people are searching for until that data set populates. Gotcha, thank you, that's yeah. fabulous. Do you, <laughs> you wanna show us, how many people say in the chat, how many people in the chat wanna see George show us how to use Merchant Words? I mean, you've seen me work it, but this is the man. He's the developer of it. You know, I, got, I just kind of hunt and peck around, right? But George is the man who knows how to use this tool. So anybody, me, me, I see in the chat, who else wants to see George, the developer of Merchant Words, show us really how to make this thing sing. You got Fantastic. <laughs> two, two quick disclaimers. Two quick disclaimers. Number, number one is uh, just because I'm the founder of it doesn't mean I'm going to not make mistakes showing you how to use it. So uh, I will absolutely show you how to use it. But I, just wanted to, I just wanted to make you blush, George, because I know how easy it is. And look at you. So, cute. so Judy says, uh, okay. here's like well, my best quote in here. <laughs> here's the first quote I love. Show me the merchant word, says Judy Scuderi. <laughs> nice, nice. Me, All right, and Lisa me. Fong, um, is it's Lisa F. I'm guessing it's Lisa Fong. We do have some Canadians in here. I do have some Canadian followers, and I know we have some questions about that, too. Um, so why don't, do you know how to screen share in Zoom, I'm gonna, George? I'm going to try right now. That was my other disclaimer I wanted to say, is I'm not quite sure how to share my screen. Do I share? Down, oh, I, uh, if okay, you kind of move your cursor down, you see that little green share screen. Just about there. Do you guys see uh, Merchant Words? There you go. Oh, how pretty. It is happy, isn't it? It's very much like your personality. Yeah, right? We wanted to make it a little more bubbly and upbeat. Totally your personality. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when you visit Merchant Words, it'll look almost exactly like this. The only difference is you won't be logged in, so you won't see your name here. But uh, you can sign up. It's really easy. We work really I hard. Let me give them the, can I give them the deal Diva discount? Of course. Please do. I'd be happy if you did. George charges like $35 a month for this tool for US and he is giving any Deal Diva followers, you're watching this, so you are a follower, you just type in merchantwords.com slash Deal Diva and you get it for $9 a month. Is that still valid? That's absolutely still valid. $9 a month. And the one thing I want to mention is, I don't know how many of you guys have ever signed up with uh, like the phone company or the TV company, and they give you this great deal and it's only for the first couple of months and then after that they hike the prices back up again. I hate that. And so this is a $9 deal that if you love us, it's always going to be $9. But if it turns out you don't like us, there's no risk because we'll be happy to give you your money back also. So now, just a caveat, because a couple of you have asked me in, the, in my Facebook group this week, uh, Lisa just asked, is it the same for Canada? Lisa, this $9 a month is just for .us. There are different prices for the other platforms, and George will tell you about that. I'm not sure what those prices are. I'm sorry, Lisa, but you can talk to George about it. <laughs> so here's one of the things, and remember my disclaimer about I don't know exactly when these products will actually be published, but we know that some people are only interested in a single country, and that country is not necessarily the U.S. Mm -hmm. Now, we have 
I don't know if it was a mistake, but we made that assumption that said, look, if you're going to have a single country, you're probably going to want U.S. And if you want multiple countries, you'll probably want the whole world. And so what we decided was to have a global program, which offers all countries, and then to have a U.S. only program, which offers just the U.S. And that's the $9 deal for uh, just U.S. You can upgrade to global later. I think it's about another $20 more. Uh, but what we've decided to do is create a plan where you can have a single country and then you decide what that country is. So if you're focusing on, um, uh, on Canada, then you can sign up for the $9 deal and then just have Canada. Now, that's not ready to go right yet, but if you want to get into our data right now, sign up for the U.S. version, maybe upgrade to global. Once we have that figured out, we'll reduce the price back down for you. We'll make it right. Don't worry. But the point is we're working on having like a Canada only or a Germany only. We don't, we don't quite have that ready yet, but we're working on it. That's wonderful. Thank you. We'll look forward. We'll just keep following you and, and wait for the updates. Thank you. Fantastic. So essentially what you're going to do is when you search right here, you're going to search through, I'm going to do just my, one of my favorite examples, Harry Potter. One of the, uh, what you have to realize right now is we're searching through about 200 million keyword phrases for anything that matches both the words Harry and Potter. So if you look down on the screen here that I'm sharing with you, two things I want to mention is across the little key uh, flags that you can see here, these sort of like tab looking things, that's telling you how many keyword variations there are. And so in the United States, with the words both Harry and Potter in any position, there are 46,000 different variations of search terms that include Harry Potter. Now I can zoom through them right now and I can I'm, I'm gonna pause you for a second. Somebody's no. saying that they can't see the screen. I'm not sure if it's just Linda or everybody. Uh, if you can see this, uh, please post in the in the chat. Yes, I can see. No, I can't see. Yes, I can. No, I can't. Or I could stop sharing and reshare it. Maybe that'll reboot the. It system. looks like everybody can see it, and it might just be an issue on her end. Okay. So um, I'm just going to ask whoever can't see it to log back out. Linda, log out and log in again. I'm not sure why you can't. What can you see on the screen? Um, <laughs> if it's just me and George. I'll work on uh, that with Linda in the chat. But go ahead, George, because it looks like everybody can see you except her. Okay, and, and you know, if we're recording this, of course, you can send the recording to her and she can watch it and see what the, what the screen share says. Uh, but across the top here is all the different numbers of variations. And then down the list is the actual variations themselves. And so if I just kind of fling through this list and look, you'll see it says Harry Potter case, Harry Potter shirts, Harry Potter audiobook. But on the column on the most right-hand side, it'll tell you all the different categories that's from. You can filter it down and be a lot more specific by saying, instead of all categories, show me just the ones, say, for example, in baby. I'm not sure how many products are going to be with Harry Potter in the baby category. Oh, many fewer, as you can see. But there's still 600 different variations of Harry Potter phrases in the baby category. And so let's say for a moment that you're interested in researching Harry Potter, but of course you sell children's items or baby items. You zoom through here and see the things that are interesting for you and then see the keyword phrase volume for each of those. But I want to come back to this concept of look at all the different numbers of variations across the top when you look at the little flags. So let's say that we were searching in Canada. I'm going to remove that filter again. Uh, I'm going to remove that filter here, take off baby and go back to all categories. And then we're going to see how many results there are in Canada. So there's almost 4,000 results for Harry Potter in Canada. Now that's fewer than the United States, but remember this doesn't necessarily affect the volume. This is a measure of the number of variations that there are. And so in the United States, 40,000 different ways that people are searching for Harry Potter. In Canada, 4,000 ways that people are searching for Harry Potter. That just means it's not quite as diverse in terms of the variation. It doesn't necessarily mean volume. Now, to look at volume, what we need to do is look at the actual keyword itself. In Canada, Harry Potter, without any additional keywords, we believe gets about a half a million searches a month. If I toggle back over to the U.S., we believe Harry Potter, without any search variations at all, gets about two million a month. And so, as kind of a measure, you can see that for the Harry Potter keyword, we believe it's about one-fourth the volume in Canada than it is in the U.S. And so that's where the, if you're comparing like a U.S. and Canada, that's how you would take a look at the search volume differences, not necessarily with the numbers across the top, because that's just variations. You look at the search volume in the data down below. Uh, one other point is, if you're very specific about your search, so let's say I'm searching for dog bowl. 
if I'm searching for dog bowl, I should get a fair amount of variation here. I'm guessing up oh, 13,000. I'll get a fair amount of variation here, 13,000 different ways that people are searching for dog bowl in the United States. And as I scroll through here, I see all those kinds of variations. But now if I wanted to hone in on that, I could be more specific with my searches. So let's say dog bowl uh, non-slip, I'm guessing. I'm just making these up off the top of my head. I have no idea if these are good demo words or not. Oh, there's only 36. So if you're researching non-slip dog bowls, this is an interesting way for you to see all the different ways people are searching for it. With a hyphen, without a hyphen, does it include a mat? Does it not include a mat? Those kinds of things. So it's really up to you to decide how broad or how focused you want your search to be by simply having a few number of search terms as you search for merchant words or a lot of search terms as you search for merchant words. So you decide how broad or narrow your focus is. That's one way to do it. You can also broaden or narrow your focus by drilling into certain categories with the filters. And then however you decide to do that in the US, you of course can march that across the other countries. Now let's do a few foreign uh, market uh, searches as well. I have no idea how to say dog bowl in French or German, but I'm gonna go ahead and search for dog bowl in all categories, and then I'm gonna take a look to see how people are searching for it in the languages of country, in the countries of the language I don't speak. So in Germany, we got 37 variations that have the word dog and bowl in it. Let's check this out. So, as you can see here, there are lots and lots and lots of English searches in Germany. Now, there's a few that have some German words in it, like dog, love, bowl, hudenpaf. Anyone who speaks German can tell me what hudenpaf means. I have no idea. Hudenpaf. <laughs> hudenpaf. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I'm, a, I'm a dumb English speaker, and I've never spoken a word of German in my life. And just five seconds ago was an example. That wasn't German either. But uh, as, as, you look through, as you look through all of these different search terms here, you can see that there are a lot of English language searches in Germany and France and Spain. But we can also search in whatever that native language happens to be. So what I could do is drill down a little bit into whatever this term means. That Either actually means dog bowl in German. Oh, fantastic. I was kind of wondering if it did and I thought that it might. So this is a great example. I can either copy it here and then paste it right back up in here again and perform a search that way. Or what I can do is I can just click on it. So if I just click on it right here. It'll do a search for just that term and then I can see the variations. Now, as you would imagine, there is almost no variations in the other markets in the world except for Germany, right? But now that we've entered a German keyword search, you can see all the variations of how people are searching for dog bowl using the German term. Now, I'm not sure how interesting this is to your audience and how uh, global they're taking their products right now, but the great thing is, uh, remember, I'm not the expert in how to take your uh, US product and take it over to Europe. Although you know, I know the basics of how that system works, but the interesting thing for me is using Merchant Words just gives you a quick peek to see how well you think your products might do in foreign markets. And so rather than take all the time and effort and energy to introduce your product there and see if you get sales or not, this is a good way to kind of scratch the surface to see what the interest is in the foreign markets. So you can either search in English because there's a lot of searches happening in those foreign markets in English, or you can search in the native language like we did here with, with Dog Bowl. And could you tell me one more time how to pronounce that? <laughs> uh, Hunde is uh, dogs and uh -huh. Napf. Napf is the bowl, dog bowl. Hunde Napf and Keramik is ceramic and Edelstahl is uh, stainless steel. And Unterlager, I thought that one was interesting, Number the sixth one down. That yep. one is, um, is actually the mat you put underneath the dog bowl. Nice. That's kind of an interesting product. Yep. So it's it's one of my it's one of my wish lists, and I think we'll do it eventually. But again, I don't know exactly when we'll roll this feature out. It's one of my wish lists that if you don't speak German, but you're researching German keywords, you'll be able to hover over these things and have that experience that Barbara and I just had. Wow, but, but that would be so cool. Yeah, so you can just hover over here and it'll tell you, oh, that means dog bowl. Oh, that means mat underneath the dog bowl, etc. Now. Translation, of course, is a, a half science and half art, but uh, we're hoping to do something like that to help folks as they're researching into other markets that they don't really speak the language, like you just saw me. I don't speak a word of German. I have no idea what I was doing, but- It's just a coincidence that I'm fluent in German. So if you chose the French, the French, this conversation would have gone very differently. And, and you know what? I had no idea. We didn't prearrange this. I'm, I know. Um, <laughs> okay, Hudenbaff. Wow. Well, what's, you know, I wonder, and this is just food for thought, not to go off on a tangent, but I wonder how you could link Google Translate into this to have that pop up. That would be interesting. 
Yeah, you know, we did it early. It wasn't a beta. We never actually released it as a beta. We did an early tech experiment to try to do exactly that. We would take all of our search terms, run them through Google Translate, and then take the, uh, you know, take whatever Google Translate has said and had that as like a suggestion. And we were discovering that Google Translate would take you off into the wrong meanings, uh, the wrong directions <laughs> of words. Because as you know, often words have multiple meanings. And oh, yeah. And in the e-commerce context, a human like you, you and I, well, I can't because I don't speak German, but exactly what each of these means in the context. But we discovered that a Google Translate without any human direction at all just really couldn't do it right, which is yeah. why we're kind of rethinking it going back to the drawing board. But there's some great opportunities here for natural language processing, a little artificial intelligence stuff. Uh, there, there's some opportunities here to be smart about assisting you to understand what these mean, just like you were telling me yourself. Uh, but just doing something as simple as Google Translate didn't quite get us where we wanted to be yet. Gotcha. It's just a thought. I'm not a programmer, so I have no clue how to make that work. Yeah. And you know what? The fun thing is, like I said, we're going to be doing um, uh, Japan shortly. And uh, when we do Japan, I mean, look, uh, oh, wow. Hood, hood enough, I can sort of stumble my way through, right? But yeah. when, when it's uh, the, the, the symbols, yeah. I mean, I, I know one or two, like exit and house and things, but the, the rest of them, I have no idea. I wouldn't but, even know how to make those symbols on my keyboard. Like, how do you search in Japanese or Chinese or... But you know what? The great, thing, or, the great thing is, as a, kind of as a member of the e-commerce ecosystem, right? Things are changing. No matter where your business currently is, you have the opportunity to take your business everywhere. So the, the cool opportunity is even though you face a little bit of difficulty not speaking German or Japanese or whatever, there's still an opportunity to take your product into those markets. You just need a little bit of help with people who speak the language as well. Cool. Yeah, okay, so in a nutshell, that's what Merchant Words is. Uh, we talked a little bit about where we came from, what we're doing now, where we're going. Uh, the other thing I wanna mention is on every search result page, you can download the list, and you download the page of search results as a CSV file, that stands for comma separated values, and the CSV file is an easy way to share data with either the rest of your team or bring it up in an Excel spreadsheet or whatever spreadsheet you happen to use. You can import it into databases and things. So that's a, a, a lot of our customers will download the CSV file of a search result, send it off to a team, and then they'll have their team find the relevant keywords and put them into their listings and things. So now does that download all just the search term or all four of the columns? It downloads just it downloads well on, on my <laughs> I should I should uh, I should tell you that we, we really only have three columns. This depth here that you see is a column that we're considering adding. We haven't yet added it yet. And uh, that depth is just another indicator of how it's like a Think of it as like a percentile strength, right? The deeper a keyword is, the less popular it becomes. And so as you scroll down the list, this is sort of like a, a growing percentile of, of lower like popularity. Almost a qualifier? Yeah, in a way, exactly right. So it's like a kind of a ratio or a, a rating, if you will. But um, uh, we haven't we have that launch. I mean, it's not secret data. We'll I'll be happy to share it with you. As you can see, it's right here on the screen share. But uh, when, when you log into MerchantWords today, you'll see the three columns, search, estimated search volume, and the dominant categories. And when you click the CSV download, we have downloaded in the CSV file the search phrase itself and the search volume. We don't yet put dominant categories in there. Uh, it's a feature we're considering adding. We probably will one day. But today, you get the search term itself and the volume. And in fact, that's what most people want anyways. That's what we started with for the CSV download. Awesome. Thank you. Um, now, as as there's there are a couple questions in the chat. I'm just going to try to reword it based and, and come up with a global question that might answer all of them. Okay. So um, some people ask, a lot of times I get asked, um, how much volume is too vol too much volume? Search volume. You know, is there a sweet spot for search volume when I'm searching for something? Yeah, it's a great question, and I would say that depends. Right, it depends on all kinds of factors. Um, and I know that it depends is a terrible answer, but you know, to be fair, it really is. Uh, if you're doing something that has broad appeal, and there will be a lot of people selling it and a lot of people looking for it, you might you might like look at the keyword phrases which have a lot of search volume to it. But if you're in a very narrow niche opportunity and you know, by the way, there's a lot of great opportunities in like these very narrow long tail uh, kind of niche -y products. But if you're in a, like having a niche product, then things that only have a few thousand estimated searches a month is probably going to be good enough to catch your interest. But I want to remind everyone that and uh, just because it says this is a search phrase, it gets high volume doesn't necessarily mean that that, single phrase drives all of the products 
uh, traffic and drives all of the products purchases. So what I mean by that is you could have one product here that has a lot of search, a lot of purchase volume is flying off the shelves. You have a product that has low search volume, not very many people buy it. And it could be that maybe a hundred different ways people search to buy this one, but maybe a thousand different ways people search to buy this one. So there may be a lot of search variation for something that has relatively low sales volume. And there may be, uh, you know, little search variation for something as lots of sales volume. So just the number of variations is not necessarily an indicator. You have to look at the strength itself. But to answer your question, when you look at the strength, there's no like one hard and fast rule. Like things above 10,000 are great to consider. Things below 10,000, ignore them. That's not the case at all. Although it's true, you should add more emphasis to the things that are more frequently searched. That's common sense. That's absolutely right. But I would say you can, should consider everything. The top, you know, the head tail keywords and then the long tail keywords as well. Consider everything. Now, my little warning, my caveat is you're not going to dump all those keywords into your listing, not in the description, not in the back end. You're not going to list, you're not going to try to put everything in there. It's like that old joke. Um, uh, the old joke starts off, an SEO expert walks into a bar and a mini bar and a bar stool. <laughs> You know, right? You're not trying to you're not trying to keyword stuff, and so don't necessarily worry about trying to get all of those keywords in there. Only use the ones that are most relevant for your product and the ones that you might not have thought of. And here's my pro tip: if you remember only one thing about my uh, my little spiel here today, here's my one pro tip. If I was a professor, I would say this will be on the test. So write this down, and that is. Rather than try to think of all of the different synonyms of your product, and rather than try to think about all the different physical attributes of your product, I would instead focus on all the different ways that people are going to use your product. So for example, just because your product weighs a certain amount and has a certain feature or has a certain function or is made out of certain material, of course that should be somewhere in your listing because it's important. But don't end there. Think about what people use your product for. Would it be a dog bowl for when I'm away on vacation? Would it be a dog bowl for when I take my dog to the beach? Yeah, George, be you just hit on um, one of my pet peeves. I uh, bet you everybody in this webinar knows that I am very much into customer-centric research and customer-centric approach to product development. So yep. for instance, just like you said, I would do dog bowl for RV owners dog bowl for handicapped dogs or older dogs or absolutely how will somebody be used and that's putting yourself in the mindset of potential customers and asking yourself the right questions who would buy this and why and what else would they buy those three questions exactly right so I've heard this concept described many different ways I've heard it I, I, I like to say I, I've, I've said this many times myself I like to say that it gives you like the Vulcan mind meld to like get on the same wavelength as your customer, understand exactly what their problems are. I've heard other people describe this as, you know, people don't buy products, they buy solutions to their problem. So you need to describe your product as if it was a solution to their problem, and then they'll buy it all day long. Because that's really what they're looking for is something that solves a problem, not necessarily the product itself. And the, the biggest takeaway for me, and this is what I always come back to when I'm thinking about a customer-centric approach is, Amazon has a lot of really smart people working for them and their goal in life, their whole overarching mission statement is to be customer centric, right? And if you're going to thrive in this ecosystem, you're going to thrive only if you're aligned with their overall goals because you might find a little nugget of quick success uh, kind of running, do, doing an end run around the rules, keyword stuffing, or, you know, doing these uh, black hat or gray hat shenanigans to try to boost your listing and things. But eventually the smart folks who write the software at Amazon are going to figure out a way to discover that you don't have the best interest of the customer at heart, that you are not a customer focused seller, that you're not making customer focused products. And because their whole mission statement is to do what's best for the customer, you'll eventually be discovered and weeded out of the ecosystem. So the way to thrive, the way to thrive in a company who's all about being customer centric is you be customer centric too. I agree completely. If you guys go to uh, my Facebook group, it's called uh, facebook.com slash group slash deal diva. This week in the past five days, I posted an article uh, showing se Amazon's seven uh, customer centric approaches. There are seven rules of law for everybody who works for Amazon. Go read that article, it's very telling. Uh, and when you have the perspective of having Am Amazon's customers or your, their customers' um, well-being at heart, their best interest at heart, then everything else falls into place. I had somebody in the past couple of days reach out 
uh, do a friend request and then friend request everybody I was friends with and send us the same message saying, please review my product. And he was trying to, and he didn't even have the, the, the main keyword in his listing. He was just, you know, blasting out to everybody in the Amazon community, uh, go review my product, go leave a review for me. Now, not, don't even get me started on uh, breaking TOS, but that is not the way to, I mean, that's like an end run, and you're also annoying other Amazon sellers, uh, especially those of us who are following Amazon TOS. Um, and that's the absolute wrong approach. The right approach is uh, to, Put yourself in the mindset and the heart and the mind and of uh, your potential customers. In fact, I would love for you to go back to Merchant Words and put oh, in sure. RV next to Dog Bowl for me out of curiosity. Yeah, sure. No problem. Because there are a ton. I love uh, mashups. I call them mashups. And a mashup are two fanatical niche markets. People who have dogs and people who have RVs are two fanatical niche markets, right? So putting those together, even if you put dog and RV, uh, what would happen? What ideas are you gonna are going to come out of searching for those two fanatical niche markets by mashing them up? Wow. Well, you have six with both a dog and bull and RV. It is actually more than I thought. But let's let's get rid of bull and broaden our focus a little bit. Yeah, people who travel with their dogs in their RV has got to be a decent size. RV accessories for dogs. Who'd have thought, right? Right. RV dog leash. RV dog toy. Great. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Now I don't have an RV, but I'll bet you there if you. Um, went into an RV group on Facebook and just started asking, survey your co potential customers and say, look, you know, if you have a dog and, and you guys travel around in your RV, what are some of the problems that you, you experience traveling with a dog in an RV? And just start collecting that information and then doing keyword research on the information that you collect and product, potential product research. Yep. I was talking to, straight to the market. I was talking to a guy who, I'll tell you two quick stories. I was talking to a guy who does private label. He's pretty good at it. And he's like, uh, you know what? You know what I discovered is it's not so much about, am I, do I have the right brand when I'm stamping, a, you know, creating a brand to stamp on an existing product? And as I'm sure you all know, private labeling is you're basically having a manufacturer manufacture an existing product. They already manufacture for a bunch of other brands. And then you're having your brand put on it. And your product actually is substantially the same as everybody else's. It might be a minor tweak, but it's almost insignificant. What you're really trying to differentiate yourself with is the brand. And I was talking to him and he's like, he's had, he's had fair success doing it. But what he said was he's had better success, not necessarily differentiating himself just on brand, but differentiating himself on purpose. So in other words, this is a widget that solves that problem, but I'm going to go create a new brand and, and market it as the widget that solves this other problem. Exact same widget. The only difference is he's marketing it for a different purpose and that will escalate the sales because when you have that purpose in mind then you resonate with the customer that's brilliant i love that idea so keep the the product the same but think about how else uh, what other people are using this product in a different way how else is this product being used and it comes down to asking the right questions again i think yeah and then my last my last little uh, point along this uh, line we can talk about other stuff i don't want to get too mired down in this content but it's super important so i don't mind spending a lot of time talking on it is i had someone come up to me after a, a presentation at a trade show and he's like okay okay uh you're, you're not on stage you're not being recorded this is just a, a private conversation between you and me tell me how i can force the right keywords into my listing to force my way up to the top of the results to force people to click on my product and force people to buy it and i'm like whoa dude okay sit down for a second uh i, I need to tell you this story and the story is uh you've all heard this uh the aesop's fable where mr wind and mr sun are up in the sky and they're fighting back and forth over who they're arguing over who is most powerful and mr wind says i'll prove it to you how powerful i am they have a bet to see who can blow the coat off of the guy who's walking by underneath them and so he blows she blows she, the harder he blows the more the guy's going like this and he's pulling his jacket tightly around his neck and the harder he goes the harder he goes and finally everybody's exhausted and he just gives up and then when it's the sunshine's turn all he has to do is just shine that's all mr sun has to do is just shine and the guy freely takes off his coat so that same little aesop fable that you may have heard since you were a kid applies here is you're not trying to battle your way into the hearts and minds of your customers you're not trying to battle your way up to first place ranking or get the best clicks or whatever get on the same side as your customers and just shine they'll take off their jacket all by themselves and buy your product if you've got a great product and they see that you're on their side i really love that story it comes down to you know i think it's a mindset issue go ahead you can stop sharing your screen and we can chat oh yeah sure Sorry, I made you scare your screen again. But it comes down to it's a mindset issue where are you 
are you fighting and, and killing your competition and uh, battle mode all the time? Or are you okay? Let's make this work. Let's let's see how we can create the most amazing experience and um, provide value to the marketplace and work within the parameters of the platform that we are being allowed to sell on in order to get to their customers. Let's make this work for everybody and profit. Completely yep. two different energies, and I choose the the second energy. Hey, George, Lisa asked, and I was ready to answer her, and I, I'll let you do it because I have my own opinion on this. Lisa says, how are you estimating it to ensure it's as close to the true Amazon search as could be? And my answer would, would have been, um, Lisa, I'm not sure George would be willing to share his, uh, his algorithms with everybody because then somebody could compete against him. But I'll let you chime in. Uh, I, I got a couple of thoughts. Number one is I'll be happy to tell you how my algorithm works. I'm not going to give you the source code, but I'll tell you essentially how it works. And uh, but then my, my disclaimer though is uh, I talked to a lot of I had an experience a few trade shows ago where I got that exact same question and I'm I'm answering it and the, the guy's pushing back a little bit because you know he wanted to disagree with what I was saying and and we were having a friendly but uh, kind of a, a debate there. All of a sudden, another customer of ours, completely unknown to me, walks up and says, hey, I overheard you two talking. I just want to let you know I've been using Merchant Words for years, and I don't even care what the number says. I just look for the stuff at the top because I know that's going to be the most popular, and I then I focus on the stuff in the middle second because I know that's the next, and I look at the bottom stuff last because I know that's last. I don't care what the numbers are. I just know that stuff at the top is good, stuff in the middle is not so good, and stuff at the bottom is worse than that. I just had, I just had, and it could be because I haven't had dinner, but I just had a, an analogy pop into my head I have to share. I don't want to know how the sausage is made, but I want to know how to cook it to make it taste really good. Exactly I, right. So um, as long as I, I don't, I don't, I don't know how my accountant does what he does, but I know he does a good job for me. And at the end, he hands me what I need to, you know, improve my business. But I don't need to know his job. And I think sometimes we get stuck in overthinking things that uh, that energy could better be used towards developing products and optimizing on lists and doing things over which um, we should be learning how to do really well. Does that yeah. make sense guys in the chat? So, uh, but, but if you don't mind, let me share my algorithm with you. I'll share my secret sauce with you. Essentially, here's, here's how it works. When, when you go to Amazon, you yourself, not you know, our software or anybody else, when you personally go to Amazon and you type the very first letter of something, you'll see 10 suggestions pop up. Those are the most frequently searched search terms that begin with that letter. And if you type a second letter, those are the most frequently searched search terms that start with those two letters. So let me give you a quick example. If you type I, a single I into Amazon, right now it'll say iPhone case, iPhone 8, iPhone, all the iPhone stuff. Now, there's millions of words that start with I, but those didn't beat iPhone. In the world of I's, iPhone beats, right? Now, if you type a G, so you've got IG, you've got Igloo Cooler. Igloo Cooler could have appeared one moment ago at just a single I, but it didn't because iPhone beat out Igloo Cooler. And then my favorite example is you type in U at the end, I-G-U, it's iguana food. You can actually, <laughs> if you've got an iguana, you can go to Amazon and buy food for your iguana uh, through Amazon.com. And, and to find iguana food, you only have to type I-G-U. You don't have to type any further than that. But what we learned from this is iguana food is less popular than igloo cooler. And both of those are less popular than iPhone. And so in our database, we have data points. It's just three data points, right? Boom, 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 three search terms, but we know their relative positions. Now, the difference is it's easy to wrap your head around that. If I were to pull someone aside and say, given the choice between iPhone, iguana food, and igloo cooler, what do you think is the most popular? It's easy for us to wrap our head around. But imagine that instead of three and their relative positions, we had 200 million and their relative positions. That's kind of hard to wrap our head around. So essentially what we do is we put all of those relative positions in our database. We know the phrases, we know their relative strengths, we know that these are higher than those, we know those are higher than these, and then we apply a little bit of fuzzy logic, and this is where the algorithm gets kind of data sciencey. We allow, apply a little bit of fuzzy logic to take an estimate and spread that estimate proportionally across all of these relative positions. So in a nutshell, that's how we come up with our estimated numbers. Now, George, I, I might be off base here, uh, so I'm okay if I'm wrong, just let me know. What I teach people is to use multiple tools. Yep. Not, and not one tool. I, I love to cook, so I have a lot of different tools in my kitchen and a lot of different knives, right? And 
not any, I might use three different tools to make a dinner, five different tools to make an amazing dinner. Based, right. So I, I want to caution people because I, I do get asked this too. Well, you know, merchant tools isn't exactly, you know, it's not perfect. And it's, well, no tool is, guys, it's okay. So predictive search, you use Google as well and you use uh, Google Trends and there are multiple tools and when you use them together, then you're, you're adding more nuance and um, more breadth to your research. So you don't have to rely on one tool. As much as I absolutely love Merchant Words and it's my starting point and you guys know that, I also use other tools to, to make that, um, the results richer. So I'm yeah. not putting down Merchant Words at all. I'm answering the question that I know somebody's gonna ask in here about you know how accurate is it so i i personally have lots of tools in my toolbox both literally i've got like six or seven different kinds of wrenches and pliers and 10 or 12 different screwdrivers right but both literally and figuratively right because i subscribe to a variety of tools to do I even subscribe to some of the tools that people consider to be competitors of merchant words because just like you just like you said i think it's interesting to have a broad view now that's not necessarily to try to prove one is better than the other all that means is you know the approach of this tool is a little different than the approach of that tool it's not that these numbers aren't like one's correct and one's not correct it's just they're different approaches to measure the same thing like if i measured the height of the building with a barometer versus a yardstick or whatever it would be different a little bit but that's almost a bad analogy because in that case that's there is an actual correct number that building has to be a certain number of inches off the ground for sure. But in the case of keyword terms, even Amazon itself has a difficult time knowing exactly how to measure it. And I'll give you a quick example, if you don't mind. I know we're uh, coming up on 15 minutes to the hour, but- That's okay, we're good, keep going. I give you a quick it's a content example. webinar. This is a content webinar. Okay, fantastic. Uh, some people have told me that what they do is they take uh, estimated search volume numbers that they get from our tool or other places, and then they see how off we are by running a paid campaign, you know, a sponsored product listing, a paid campaign, and then looking at their keyword, uh, you know, uh, impressions from the paid campaign and kind of compare that back. And my first reaction is, Fantastic, because the more sources of keyword data you have, the better, the more informed you are. You should absolutely take uh, you know, tools that cost a few bucks a month and, and give you a, an estimate across hundreds of different millions of search results, but compare that to also the more surgical uh, approach where we're gonna pay a lot of money, but we're gonna do deep research on these few keywords. They're, they're both fantastic approaches. But what's interesting though is when you get that impression data back, one of the things is you're only seeing impressions for the times you won that position. There are other sellers who are also selling that get that impression slot sometimes. So you don't see the whole pie, you see your slice of the pie. And I've had people actually say, well, no, I solved that problem because I bid like $50 a click. So I know I'm, I'm always the winner and I'm always appearing there. So I know for sure I'm always there. Maybe, but the other interesting thing is no matter how you appear there or how often your, your other sellers appear in that slot, your ad impressions show for both the number of times your sponsored product appeared on a search result page, which is what you want, but it also includes impression data from the number of times your sponsored product listing appeared at the bottom of somebody else's product page in that section that says we also suggest or people also bought. When your product appears there, that counts as an impression. And what Amazon does is they take the impression of your sponsored product from the bottom of a page and combines that with the number of impressions from your search result page and shows you that number amalgamated together. Now I can't say for sure if Amazon does that on purpose because they're trying to kind of obfuscate or hide the true numbers that, that are behind the scenes there or not. I don't know, maybe, maybe they had a hiding effect to be able to do that or maybe they, it's just a side effect of how they uh, structure their data. I don't know, but the point is, no one tool is gonna absolutely tell you, like for example, the height of a building, no one's gonna tell you exactly precisely how many search terms occurred on Amazon, even if you use Amazon's own search terms themselves. Yeah, and I'll, I'll keep bringing this back to mindset because it's, I think it's as important as any tool you use. The, a black and white mentality, I also refer to it as a lottery ticket mentality. You say, okay, I'm gonna buy this tool for $9 a month and it's gonna give me everything I need to be successful. So that's not the case. Um, we, we have to have different tools and different uh, methods by, that give us more information, as much information as we can get, in order to make our own decisions. So when you take responsibility for your business and your, uh, the decisions that you're making in your business with your listings and your product sourcing and whatever, you recognize that all of these tools are just ways to gather information to help you make 
more informed decisions, but no one tool or any group of tools is going to suddenly, without your own independent thought added in, going to make you profitable or successful. Yep, exactly right. Let me give you a final, and like I said, I don't want to belabor this one. I've used it for a while. Imagine that your job is to trek across the jungle the Amazon jungle, right? But you know, real jungle, right? Rivers, waterfalls, streams, everything. And before you head out, you go into town and you see if you can hire a guide. Who's native to the area, who's, who's, who's like experienced there. So what you want to do is go into town and say, excuse me, can I, can I hire you for a little bit of money to come uh, accompany me through the jungle? I'd really, uh, and if some guy raises his hand, you'd be like, great, fantastic, you're hired. And you wouldn't say, no, no, I'm going to get all my information from the first guy. You might be say, okay, you come along and I've got a little extra money. You come along too. Both of you guys come along. So now you got two guides coming along with you. You come to, the, uh, come to like a, a split in the road where you can either cross that river over there or you can cross that river over there. You want to talk to both of your guides and ask them what they think about it. But if one says that river is a lot shallower and flows a lot slower, this one's deeper and flows faster, I recommend you do the shallower one. You ask your second guide. I recommend I do your, the shallow one and the uh, slow one also. Don't go for the deep and the steep one. If you were to turn around and look at both of those guides, you wouldn't necessarily say, wait a minute, I can't trust your judgment because do you know exactly how many meters per second that flows? And do you know exactly how many meters deep that is? And do you know exactly how many gallons per minute flows across that thing? You wouldn't really push back on them and say, because you don't have absolute measurements, I can't trust your judgment. You would look at both of those guys and say, wow, Guide number one says, go across that river. It's slower and easier. Guide number two says, go across that river. It's slower and easier. I'm going over that river, right? So it's a real simple analysis to understand that you might not have precisely measured data, but when you're getting good guidance from multiple sources, man, that's fantastic stuff. You better listen to your guides. And when you get multiple sources of information, be careful that you don't end up stalling and saying, oh, well, this person said this, and they said that, and this tool did this, and that. well, I don't know what to do now, and giving up. Just collate the data, examine the data based on your criteria for your business, and make a decision. Yep. So don't get stuck in analysis paralysis, right? Make exactly a decision right. after gathering all the information, and then, um, you know, as, as you move along your path to continue this Amazon analogy, <laughs> you, you make twists, there's going to be twists and turns, and you just pivot and you make small decisions along that path. Um, so that's my analogy. Especially when it comes to keywords, because in my analogy, yeah, you can change your mind and go back over the river you just crossed uh, mistakenly, but look how easy it is if you put in a keyword that you didn't like. You put in a keyword, it wasn't the right one, pull it out and put in one you like. It's not that difficult. It takes 10 seconds, click, 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 upload. <laughs> right, it's not the end of the world, just a test. Hey, can you speak to the new um, 250 character rule from Amazon? Yeah, and so what I want to do before I do that is just go back and remind everyone that remember, you're doing this to be customer focused. You're not doing this to be keyword stuffy. You're not doing this to like force people to find your listing or force your listing up to the top of the ranks. So keep that in mind as we have this uh, next part of our conversation. So Amazon will never ever publicly say exactly how any of their algorithms work. They make changes to algorithms all the time and they don't tell us. The other thing to remember is their algorithm doesn't necessarily apply to every product in every category immediately at the same time. It could be that they roll out feature changes. It could be that they apply aspects of their algorithm in one category but not in another category. We don't know for sure because Amazon has never told us, but remember, there's no such thing as like the one right way that Amazon treats a listing. Even at this moment, it could be different in this category, and it could be different in that category, it could be different for one seller to the other. There's no way to know for sure. Now, the one way there kinda is to know for sure is experiment and try it out. And that's what a lot of people have done. Uh, you know, folks who have other, uh, you know, Amazon software companies have run experiments. I've run experiments myself personally. People have written blog posts. Sellers have posted their own experience. And when you read all this stuff, you can kind of glean patterns emerging. So it absolutely seems that the first few words in a title are the ones that have the most weight for matching purposes in the search results and in your back-end keywords it absolutely seems like there's there's evidence to support that the first few words in each of those uh, boxes where you can put in keywords absolutely weighs more than the rest is it precisely 250 is it 260 is it 240 you know I don't know for sure and in fact I wouldn't even get involved in an argument over exactly how that is but I can absolutely agree with you and say put your most important keywords 
up front, if you're going to have more after, if you're going beyond that 250, because the box will hold a thousand characters, right? If you're going beyond 250, I can't tell you that you're going to be penalized. I can't tell you that you're going to waste your time. Maybe perform an experiment and see for yourself. But what I can tell you is if you put your best keywords in there and you have 250 characters of your best keywords, that probably will capture many of the intent that your customer has for search. In other words, many of the good keywords that you would want to put in there, I think you should be able to fit in about 250 characters. But consider this also, backend keywords are really fantastic for things that you don't want your customer to see. And that's almost counterintuitive because our whole exercise is trying to be aligned with what the customer wants, the customer's intention. We're trying to do that mind meld to understand what's in the mind of the customer and to get right in touch with their intention and what precisely they want and for the purpose they're looking for it so those things don't belong in the back key, back end keywords at all they belong in your bullet points they belong in your description they belong in your title if it's appropriate to put in your title that's where they belong and the kind of thing that belongs in the back end keywords those are very specific uh, for me they're very specific reasons why you'd want to hide something from the end user but still tell Amazon that it should match your product I was chatting with someone who uh, sold incontinence, uh, you know, undergarments, and she didn't really want her brand to be associated with like uh, pee pee, potty, wet the bed, uh, those kinds of things, because they had kind of an embarrassing connotation, but she wanted her product to still match those kinds of searches. Um, I also had a, a, a good friend of mine, she sells jewelry, and she said, you know, a lot of our people buy, buy this jewelry for where they're going to adult parties, you know, where people uh, engage in a lifestyle that really she didn't didn't, uh, wasn't compatible with what she wanted and she didn't want her brand to be represented by you know how people use her jewelry at these adult parties and now she still wanted her jewelry to appear when people were doing these adult oriented search terms but she didn't want that to appear anywhere in her brand so there's a couple of specific cases where it makes sense to put things in your back-end keywords and in that case I don't think you can uh, I don't I don't think the limit of 250 or 1,000 or whatever it is I don't think that's too onerous of a limit I think you're perfectly happy taking all of your hidden keywords and operating in those kinds of constraints because if you discover fantastic keywords, work them into your listing somehow in the visible areas. Make a great bullet point out of it, add to an existing bullet point if it's relevant, put it in your description somewhere. So my advice is always putting on the, here, I'm gonna put on my, I'm gonna put on my glasses of I'm putting the customer first. These are my glasses of I'm putting the customer first. When I'm, when I'm looking at the world through the glasses of put the customer first, Wait, 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 wait. I have my own. Too. Hang on, I've got my own, everybody. Wait, I've been, I've been dying to pull these guys out. Are you ready? Yeah, I am ready, yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> now, now remember, we're never gonna we're never going to sacrifice the experience of the customer no. for money. No. So those dollar signs don't represent money by screwing our customers or tricking no. our customers. That money byproduct, byproduct the, of doing things the right way. Exactly right. That money is a byproduct, is the reward for doing things the right way. So when you view the world through the lens of I'm putting my customer first and my customer interests are my interests, then you look at that and you say, wow, this keyword belongs in front of my customer. Don't necessarily hide it in the back end. Put it in the front end somewhere if it really belongs. And if it doesn't belong, what are you doing stuffing it in your listing in the first place? But there are certain contexts, like I mentioned, that make sense. And so there, sure, naturally. But generally speaking, I'd say if it truly belongs, if it's truly relevant for your product, work it into the, the, the places there. You know, I have a theory for um, why Amazon, and I could be completely off base, just a thought, why Amazon instituted this 250 characters, because they were trying to discourage people from doing keyword stuffing by throwing in five lines of, you know, 20,000 characters of keywords that had zero relevance to the product just to get traffic to their page, which is counterintuitive anyway, because if they got um, uh, unqualified traffic to that page, and they didn't buy, then they'd go down in the rankings. So they weren't really thinking. But I, I, I have a feeling that they were trying to prevent people from doing the keyword stuffing. Not that everybody is, but there, you know, there are some unsavory sellers out there who try whatever. Uh, that's my theory, but it's, of course it's not tested. Yep. I don't and, have an in line to Mr. Jeff, so and, and I can't verify it. It's kind of like, uh, you know, how much can I cheat on my taxes, right? If, if you cheat on your not going to catch you. If you cheat on your taxes a lot, then yeah, you're looking for trouble. So be careful with where you put your keywords. 
I agree. So any, any last thoughts? First of all, if you guys didn't hear, you, go, you can go get Merchant Words for nine bucks a month instead of the 35 for the US version. Uh, and go to merchantwords.com slash deal diva. And I'll write that again in the chat. You can also follow me if you haven't already uh, on my Facebook group, Deal Diva. So it's uh, just search for Deal Diva Wholesale and Private Label. It's facebook.com slash group slash Deal Diva. And George, how can people follow you? Because you are a wealth of amazing information and, and really funny jokes <laughs> so, and great stories. So how can they find you? Oh, well, you can find me on Facebook, although I got to tell you, often, uh, you know, I forget to check my Facebook every day, so I'm not the best Facebook citizen, but you can find me on Facebook. You just search for George Lawrence and you'll find me. Uh, you, uh, my company, you know, Merchant Words also has a Facebook and a Twitter. It's uh, our handle is just at Merchant Words. And, uh, you know, if you go to MerchantWords.com at the very bottom, you'll see all our social handles there. I have to be honest with you. I'm not actually the best at maintaining a, a really great social profile, but if you're ever in Los Angeles, where I live. That's my hometown. If you're ever in Los Angeles, let me know. I'd take you out to lunch. We'll sit down together. I'd love to hear all about your business. I'd love to hear about how I can help you. If, if I'm ever at a trade show or at a, a conference and a speaking engagement or whatever, catch me after the show, sit down with me. Uh, when I get down off this day, I, wherever you can find me or meet me, I would love to sit down with you, help you out, learn about your business, give you some tips in person, find me on social. Great. Shoot me an email. I'm George at merchantwords.com. That comes straight to me. Uh, sometimes I get a little bit behind in my inbox. So patience, but uh, really reach out to me and connect with me any way that you can. I would love to help you. Well, in having seen George at several conferences in the past couple of months, I can tell you two things. One, he's absolutely genuine and, and truly has a, a and, he, and your whole family actually has a heart of uh, just, just being of service and helping. And two, when he has a booth there, he's got the most comfortable couches <laughs> I've ever experienced at a trade show. <laughs> and really great goodies too. He's got these really cool markers. <laughs> so uh, go go check them out. So well, Chris, if you look, you, yeah, go ahead. If you've ever worked a trade show, you'll know it's murder standing on your feet all day long. And so I figured as long as we're going to be there helping folks, why should we stand up and have a conversation? Let's have a big old couch where we can sit down, you can sit down, we can relax and chat. Well, not only that, that, but I, th I think this little detail I'm going to share with you. Hang on, guys. I'm going to share this detail. This little detail is indicative of the care and um, the, the little extra that these folks do with merchant words in their development of it. When they put down the carpet, they put down this really thick padding and had this really thick carpet. When you stepped on his carpet, people were coming by the booth just to take off their shoes and walk around on their carpet because it was this cushy, soft, you just wanted to like lay down on this shag carpet because it was so comfy. And I think just the, there's, you, you guys have probably heard me say the saying that the difference between ordinary and extraordinary is just that little extra. And one of the reasons I asked George to um, invest time on this webinar for us is uh, is so that because I believe he is one of those people, he and his entire team that bring that little extra to whatever he does. So I'm thrilled that you agreed to take time out of your busy schedule to be with us tonight, George. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. You're making me tear up a little bit. The pleasure. Oh, you made me cry. Oh, said, uh, oh my. So global with one of your talks. So <laughs> <laughs> back at you. Okay, so everybody say goodbye to Santa. Oh, come on now. And, and, when, you say, you just... and when you say goodbye, tell me what you want for Christmas. I want those uh, photo lights. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I just want the, the links to the photo lights so I can buy those photo lights so I don't I don't look like I'm glowing in the yeah, dark. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting I'm sitting under big bright lights right now. Ooh. <laughs> well, thank you everybody for taking time out of your evening tonight. You guys are fabulous that you were here. Oh, uh, someone wants to know what the lights are called. Oh yeah, yeah. Let me show you. If you don't mind, I'm just gonna pick up my laptop and spin it around for yes. you. Yes. Here's here's what they look like. They're big pancake lights. And from the side, they're very thin. It's, it's dark outside now, but you can see they're very thin. And I believe they're called, uh, I believe they're called Photiox Photo, well, here. I put pancake lights. Pancake lights, yeah. I don't know if you can see that or not, but they're called flapjacks. Flapjacks, oh, how cool, flapjacks, I don't remember that. Does that show up on the camera? I can't it really does, think. it does, flapjacks. I'll write that in the chat for everybody. So thank you, um, everybody, for being in here. We've got a lot of people, George, saying thank you for your time. You did a fabulous job. They're very happy. So um, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for it's, being here. You're very gracious. I appreciate you spending time with us. Ah, let's see if I can do that. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye. Ciao.